Well, we pick up again today our series in the first 12 chapters of Isaiah, and we've come now to the middle of chapter 8, uh, and we're looking tonight at verses 11 to 22 of Isaiah chapter 8. So let me pray, and then I'll briefly review where we've got to uh, before we look at these verses together. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Open your word to us now, we pray. May your Holy Spirit be our guide and teacher. Lord, show us, we pray, wonderful things from your word. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, you may remember that in the opening five chapters uh, of Isaiah, uh, a picture is painted by Isaiah of Judah beset by corruption and greed, uh, religious formalism, hypocrisy and cynicism toward God. And then in chapter 6, Isaiah is commissioned by God to be his prophet to the people of Judah and their king Ahaz. And Judah feels threatened by an alliance between northern Israel and Syria. And so Ahaz, rather than trust God, uh, made an alliance, if you remember, with Assyria. And then in chapter 7, Isaiah is sent by God to King Ahaz to tell him that the threats of the Israel and Syria alliance will come to nothing, and he should put his trust wholly in God. If you do not stand firm in your faith, Isaiah tells the king, you will not stand at all. And when Ahaz refused to obey God's instruction to ask for a sign of God's faithfulness, God, you may remember, answers with a future prophetic sign to the whole house of David, the sign of the virgin-born son, a child called Emmanuel, God with us. And so we've now reached a section of Isaiah in which we're going to be presented with two ways of living, of the way of darkness and the way of light. Now one can easily see the theme of darkness and light beginning back in chapter 8 and verse 5 and running right through to chapter 9 and verse 7. And in these verses, the themes of darkness and light are interwoven. And in a way that I trust will help us understand these verses, I'm suggesting five characteristics of the way of light, paralleled with characteristics of the way of darkness. Now to see the first, of these, first two of these, we need to briefly glance back to some verses that we studied together last time because the way of light is characterised first of all by the provision of God in verse 6. And we saw that, that in that verse that God's provision for his people was pictured as the gently flowing waters of Shiloh, a picture of Jerusalem as the city of God, living in trusting faith on the, prov on the provision of God. Now to human eyes, uh, Shiloh didn't look very spectacular but it was bountiful provision of God's promises to those who walk in his paths. But verse 6 told us that Judah had rejected Shiloh and had turned instead to the mighty river, the Euphrates, in verse 7. And thus the way of darkness is turning to human provision, to what looks in this world's eyes to be strong and powerful, but in the end, verse 8, you are swept away in a torrential flood. So there's the first choice, God's provision or human provision. And the decision we make determines whether we walk in the way of light or in the way of darkness. But we can also see from those previous verses that the way of light is characterised by the presence of God, verse 10. And here we saw that the way of light is the way of Emmanuel, of the God who is with us. And so now in our passage today we can add three more. So firstly, we see the way of light is also characterised by the fear of God, verses 11 to 15. First in verse 11, Isaiah tells us something about how God communicated his prophetic word to him. The Lord spoke to me with his strong hand upon me, writes Isaiah. It's a picture of tough tenderness. God puts his hand on Isaiah so that he may speak to him these important words of warning, a warning as the verse continues not to follow the way of this people. And who are this people? Well, in Isaiah's day, they were the religious leaders as well as the country's political leaders. 
And as we've seen in previous chapters, they were in rebellion against God. They were walking in the way of darkness. God says to Isaiah, don't follow them, don't listen to them. Why? Because these people had an outlook that was dominated by short-term worldly perceptions. God continues then in verse 12 with some specifics. Do not call conspiracy everything that these people call conspiracy, says God to Isaiah. Now it's not stated exactly what is meant by the general belief in conspiracy. But I do think there's a warning for us here. Because it's all too easy, I think, when things go against us to become somewhat paranoid. and believe that everything that happens is a conspiracy against us. I don't know whether you remember Jacob back in Genesis chapter 42 when his sons returned from Egypt the first time without Simeon. What does Jacob say to them? You have deprived me of my children. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. Everything is against me. Chapter 42, verse 36. Read on uh, and you'll find that that wasn't quite the case. But back in Isaiah chapter 8, it seems more likely from the context that what these people regarded as conspiratorial was Isaiah's message because Isaiah rejected the power politics of King Ahaz and commanded obedience to and faithful reliance upon God. And how often that occurs today, that those whose message is that the people of God, the church, should return to God and to his word, turn away from man-made schemes and ideas, that they're always seen as the troublemakers. That's what happened at the time of the Protestant Reformation. And sadly, it's often what happens today when faithful men and women in certain churches call for godly obedience to Scripture. But God also has a word for Isaiah in the second half of verse 12. Do not fear what they fear, and do not dread it. Now this is exactly the message that Isaiah had preached to King Ahaz back in chapter 7. And now God uses the same words to Isaiah, do not fear what they fear. And of course the Lord Jesus Christ says to those walking in the way of light today, do not fear, you are of more value than many sparrows. Matthew 10, 31. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. John 14, 27. And so we can say in the words of the psalmist, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Psalm 118, verse 6. But there are two different kinds of fear being talked about in these verses in Isaiah chapter 8. There is the fear of those walking in darkness, an unhealthy fear, fear of other people, fear of being different from the worldly crowd, fear of being known as a Christian, or on a spiritual level, fear of unforgiven sin, fear of dying unsaved. And for those and other unhealthy fears, God says to us what he says to the prophet Isaiah, do not fear what they fear. But then as we read on into verse 13, there's a second type of fear. A healthy fear of those walking in the light. And God says to us, don't fear the so-called movers and shakers. Fear the Lord of hosts. And this is another key verse in Isaiah. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. The King James authorised version gets closer to the original with its staccato, Sanctify the Lord of hosts, and him you fear, and him you dread. So what does it mean to sanctify the Lord of hosts? One commentator puts it like this, To sanctify God is to demonstrate that he is high and lifted up in power and in character, as well as in his very essence. In other words, it's what we saw, or rather it's what Isaiah was seeing and doing in the opening verses of chapter 6. To sanctify the Lord is to worship him as holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And To sanctify the Lord is to say in response, woe is me for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. 
The old hymn writers were spot on when they wrote, Fear him, ye saints, and you will then have nothing else to fear. And which kind of fear we have will show us which way we're walking in, the way of darkness or the way of light. But there's more because we discover in verse 14, verses 14 and 15, that the attitude we take towards God, whether we or not we fear him, will determine what aspect of him we experience. Because to those who fear and sanctify him, he becomes, verse 14, a sanctuary, a place of refuge and of peace. But to those who will not fear or reverence, in the second half of that verse, he becomes a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And again, at the very end of that verse, a trap and a snare. And the five verbs in verse 15, stumble, fall, broken, snared, captured, show the consequences are severe. And here we have an illustration, a warning of Jesus and his gospel becoming a stumbling block. And then in the New Testament is made by Jesus in the gospels as well as by Paul and Peter in their letters. That's why having a right fear of God is a crucial hallmark of those walking in the light. But we also see in this passage that the way of light is characterised by the word of God in verses 16 to 18. And here we meet the faithful remnant, those walking in the light. In verse 16, God calls them my disciples. And in verse 18, Isaiah refers to them as the children the Lord has given me. And God gives a command to Isaiah in verse 16, bind up the testimony and seal up the law among my disciples. Now these words, the testimony and the law, are key to this part of Isaiah chapter 8. They'll appear again in verse 20, to the law and to the testimony. And these are two words meaning instruction and law that are used in the Old Testament to denote the revelation of God by God. Indeed, in the Hebrew, there are no definite articles. They are merely testimony and law. So God says to Isaiah, bind up all the revelation I have given you about myself. Bind up my account of myself. Bind up what I, God, want you to believe about me and how I therefore want you to live. Bind it up and seal it among those who are truly mine. When we put it like that, it's very clear that what we're meant to be understanding here is the very word of God. It's as if Isaiah has written down all that God has shown him and all that God has said to him. He's read it to the faithful remnant and they've said, yes, that's, he said that. That's what God said. What's the natural and proper reaction of God's people who have read God's word? Verse 17, I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. I will put my trust in him. Yes, God may be hiding his face from his people, called here the house of Jacob, but I will wait, I will trust or as the psalmist writes in Psalm 130, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits for him, and in his word do I hope. Wait and trust. A combination of patience with confidence. That even in the gathering darkness, even the faithful remnant, those walking in the light, are supported and sustained by an expectant faith and a sure hope. But notice that in both these examples, the virtue is not merely in the waiting. It's what we're waiting for that matters. In the New Testament, the aged Simeon wasn't just waiting. He was waiting for something. He was waiting for the promises contained in the word of God to be fulfilled. And that's what we see here in verses 16 and 17, that waiting needs to go hand in hand with God's word. Trusting needs to go hand in hand with God's word. And reading God's word, loving God's word, obeying God's word, waiting for God's word are all another hallmark of those who are truly people walking 
in the light. And so what differentiates the true Israel from the national Israel, the true church from the nominal church, those walking in the light from those walking in the darkness, is that as true children of God, we've been given a word from outside of us, from God. Not a word from the experts, not from the opinion formers, not from the speculators, not from the media gurus, but from God. For ours is a God who speaks. And we as a church need to say with Isaiah in verse 20, to the law and to the testimony, everything we believe and do must be tested by Scripture. For unless the Christian church can agree that the Bible as it stands is the very word of God, it is, as we shall see in these closing verses, walking in darkness and not in light. So to recap, we've seen thus far that those who walk in the light are characterised by the provision of God, the presence of God, the fear of God and the word of God. And finally, by the light of God, verses 19 to 22. And at the start of verse 19, Isaiah refers to men, when men tell you. So who are these men? Well, I think they're the same group as this people back in verse 11, when God warned Isaiah not to follow the way of this people. They're the, these people of verse 12 who are the conspiracy theorists. They're the many in verse 15 who stumble and fall over God's word. And so God says to Isaiah in verse 19, when these people tell you to consult mediums and spiritists who whistle and mutter, then your response should be to, to ask, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? So there are, I think, at least two lessons to apply to ourselves here. First, that we should take God's word as clearly forbidding his people to, uh, to indulge in any form of spiritism, occult practices, horoscopes or the like. But I think second, there's a wider point. Because I think that if there's a fault line in the church today, it runs along the line of how scripture should respond to the world around us and the prevailing culture. So sadly for many, the culture determines how they read the Bible, whether it's about marriage or gender roles, the origins of life, the sanctity of human life. And for many, there's a kind of ongoing project to try and make the scriptures mean something other than they really mean, so that they will be more acceptable to the prevailing culture around us. And that's exactly what's going on in here in these closing verses of Isaiah 8. Where Isaiah is arguing for the authority of the word of God against a kind of situationalist reading of the Bible. What does Isaiah say here? Verse 20. Back to the Bible. Where Isaiah puts it to the law and to the testimony. And that's what all true believers need to be saying. Why? Well, that's the remaining part of verse 20, because if they do not speak according to this word, that is God's revealed word, they have no light of dawn. What does the light of dawn show? That a greater light, a better light, is coming. But these folk don't see it. In verse 21, they look upward to heaven to see if any relief is coming. But they find all things heavenly are closed to them. And so in verse 22, they look down toward the earth. And that's no more illuminating. They see only distress, darkness, and fearful gloom. And they will be thrust into utter darkness. What did Jesus say to Nicodemus? This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light, will not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. You see what Jesus is saying? He's telling us that the path we're walking on through life is decided by what we love and by what we hate. Because if we love the power of this world, if we love the philosophy of this world, if we love the approval of this world, if we love the trappings of this world, 
If we love the sinful pleasures of this world, then we'll hate the light. When we hear Jesus Christ say that I am the light of the world, we won't just not be interested. We'll try and run in the opposite direction. And we'll close our ears. And we'll certainly close our Bibles. And bit by bit, we'll close our hearts too. Everyone, says Jesus, who does evil, hates the light. And so these verses from Isaiah, I think, challenge us to ask, so which path will we choose? Which path will you be walking today? The way of light or the way of darkness? Do you know in your daily life the provision of God and the presence of God? Do you have a right fear of God? Do you read, treasure and obey the word of God? I pray that you do. That if you don't, you won't let this day end without seeking with a contrite heart his provision, his presence, his forgiveness and his salvation. And if you do, then you will be able to echo from your own heart these famous words of Isaiah's next chapter. That the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them has the light shined. Amen. Praise be to God.